to see people that we've known for, I've known at least for decades, Beth hasn't, but some of you are getting to know her. We are just delighted for this time together. And I am so thankful for the opportunity that we have this evening to look into God's Word about a very, very vital, important subject from a well-known text to most of us, probably. Let's quiet ourselves before we open the text. Lord Jesus, we do cast our cares upon you. You are the great burden bearer. We thank you that every minute we spend in prayer with you is sweet. Thank you that you have given us this immeasurable privilege to have an intimate, close, trusting relationship with the creator of the universe. We can hardly grasp it. And we thank you that it is so because of the wonderful ministry of Jesus, giving his lifeblood on the cross that we might have life. Now we ask you, Holy Spirit, to take charge of our hearts, our ears, our minds, our wills, our concentration, and help us focus upon you. We thank you for your great goodness to us. Lead us into your truth tonight. We confess, Lord, we are sinners and we have sinned. We've done it. We need cleansing and where that's still true tonight, we pause to confess to you our sin, sin and sinfulness and ask you for your cleansing of our hearts, that nothing would stand in the way of your voice to us. Send the strong righteous, holy, powerful, supernatural, beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I, I just have a feeling that's not verified by any research. I haven't talked to all of you, but I have a feeling that I'm in the presence of quite a few people who've been desperate. At one time or another, maybe even right now. And the thought of addressing the subject of desperate praying, I think, hits a felt need deeply in the hearts of maybe most of us. If not tonight, at least as you look back over your life, perhaps at a time in the past. I heard this, <clears throat> this phrase a few years ago, Desperate parents make the best parents because desperate pra parents are praying parents. <laughs> and I, I don't think I would miss any if all of the parents would raise their hands. I'm not asking for that. <clears throat> that if you look back over your parenting time and you say, yeah, we had some desperate moments. Maybe the whole time wasn't desperate, but there were, with all of us, probably desperate moments I can remember a few, and I was totally beyond anything. I couldn't figure out what to do, and I just cried out to God, and he gave help. Some are desperate with their physical needs. Others are desperate in their business associations or in their work or their company. There's desperation all around us. So let's turn our attention to 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a man, a certain man, in Ramathaim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, 
the son of Joram, son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, a Nephrathite. He had two wives. Bad mistake. Bad mistake. Oh, the bad mistake's not in the text. I'm sorry. The name of the one was Hannah. The name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. I need to pause here. <clears throat> I'm going to use the term go to church, but this was a little more complicated for them because they had to go to Shiloh, which was a central meeting place in the country. So if you picture Israel like Indiana, they had to go to Indianapolis to go to church. It was out of the way. It was difficult. And they went every year. That was prescribed. But they went in spite of, not because of, the good spiritual leadership. I was told to, to get used to the colors. And <laughs> the, the lights shine on my face and probably color my face, whatever. Hophni and Phineas were jerks. Eli used a wet noodle to correct his sons. Oh, sons, don't do that. And they were awful. But that didn't deter Elkanah from saying, we're going to go anyway to worship. Bad preacher, doesn't matter to me. We're going to go anyway. It's what we're required to do by God, and we're going to do it. Good man. Really good man. A man of deep conviction and practice. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Now, it's a problem to have two wives. It was never God's plan. It happened often in the Old Testament, but it was never God's plan. And every single time it happened, it was filled with problems. And it looks to me like he's creating his own problem here. Here's the wife who's barren. God had closed her womb, the text says. And he favors her. He loves her. And the one who's born him all these children, it doesn't say he doesn't love her, but he, in some sense, neglects her. Maybe that provokes her. It certainly didn't make her feel good. Penina was ticked. I think that's the Hebrew word for it. <laughs> and so she went to work. And her rival, <clears throat> Hannah's rival, Penina, used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. You can almost hear it in today's na 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 I, I'm better than you. I have children. God's blessed me. You're a nothing. It was put down language. It was mockery. And it hurt very deeply. Now, here's the thing that's crazy. And I wonder, was Elkanah unobservant? Did he not see that? Couldn't he stop Penina? It doesn't say in the text. We have to wonder. <clears throat> and <clears throat> verse 7 says, So it went on year by year. <laughs> so picture this. You're going to church. <laughs> and every time you go to church, this circus happens. This charade takes place. This, this bickering, this making fun takes place. How would you feel on the receiving end of that kind of treatment? Well, we don't have to guess. The text says very clearly what happened. As often she went up, verse 7, to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. They were supposed to eat of the sacrificial meal. She didn't participate. It ruined her experience of worship. It was a terrible situation. 
And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? All of those questions are, are good, and he wanted to understand her. I'm not so sure about the next sentence. Am I not more to you than ten sons? Now, I've spoken from this passage a number of times, and I've asked the ladies among them, among those who've listened in the past, what do you think of this question? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Did that bring comfort to Hannah's heart? <laughs> I hear the nose coming from the crowd. It was a grave burden. Even this sentence, he might have meant well, but it wasn't a feel-good sentence by any means. He didn't really lift her up. And so she felt misunderstood, put down, and very hurt. And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. So maybe, commentators think that maybe after he said those words, it convinced her she did have to eat. So she must have eaten something. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, Hannah, was deeply distressed. I looked up all those words, and it's, you can't really find words strong enough to say it in English stronger than we have here. Deeply distressed. And she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. We agonize with her. It hurts to read that. It's, it's a situation where we think, oh my, this dear lady, so burdened. And my wife, before we got married, she said, I wanted to go to Bible school, and, and I was never able to, so I married the professor. So we come we come to a passage like this, and, and she asks questions that I can't answer. The only thing I can say is, I don't know. I'm not much of a good professor. I say, I don't know a lot. How do we know why she wanted to have a child? We don't know that. We do know that childbearing is in the heart of many, if not most, women. And some, from early childhood, are thinking of childbearing. And that's not the guys, that's the gals. They, the little children, I've watched little girls, and they are very anxious to be mothers. I don't know if it was that, just what's kind of normal, or she had a particular intense desire to have children. We aren't told. She wept bitterly as she prayed. By the way, note this. Deeply distressed, deeply dis deeply distressed, she prayed. That's really a good half sentence not to forget ever. When you are deeply distressed, pray. When you are brokenhearted, pray. When the burdens are heavy, pray. Go to God. I am struck, stunned by how many professing believers, when life gets hard, they say crazy things like God must not exist. They profess to know him, and then life gets hard, and they say God must not exist. Or this Christian life is not real. And they, they distance themselves from God rather than doing the right thing, which is get closer to God. Turn to God, not from God. She did the right thing. She was a good woman. She wept bitterly and prayed. Um, actually, we have the same thing from Jesus in Luke 22, 44. He wept bitterly and prayed. She did the right thing. And then verse 11, in verse 11, we come to something that's amazing. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant. So, I mean, think about her words for a moment. 
God knows everybody. He doesn't forget anything. He, but she's wanting to drive home with intensity the weight of the burden on her heart. And she's saying, please do not overlook my burden, my need. <clears throat> but will give your servant a son, then I will give. Please give me, then I will give. She is not self-possessed. She is not thinking self-centeredly. You give me a child and I'll keep it. She doesn't have a child. She doesn't ask for multiple children. She doesn't ask for many. She asks for one. And she said, if you give me one, I'll give it. Before she gets it, she's giving it. That's an empty heart. Empty of self. Give your servant a son. She asks specifically. Is there anything wrong with making specific prayer requests? And the answer is obviously no. God doesn't chide her. No one corrects her. This is a valid request. This is a burden on her heart. She wants a son, and she asks God for a son. But she makes something very clear in this text. Give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. He will be a Levite by birth, but a Nazarite by vow. She's putting her son under the Nazarite vow. He will live as a child under the Nazarite vow. Now, that all sounds great. It really does sound good. But Eli, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. So she gives us the first biblical illustration of praying silently, but verbalizing the words. I have found it extremely helpful when praying to speak loudly because lots of people, students all through the years when I was teaching the prayer class would ask me, how can I focus? My mind takes off in all directions and they say, speak it out loud. Speak your prayer out loud. Verbalize it. But if you're around people, you can't verbalize it. And she wasn't making a show like in the New Testament, Jesus corrected praying to be seen of people. She was not doing it for that reason. She was doing it out of a broken spirit. So she said her words. You heard that. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Oh my, Eli, you missed it badly. He didn't check you could have found that out in a few seconds by walking over and smelling the air around her. You'd have smelled the alcohol if she were drunk. Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? So picture this. She's got all of this of her, of the other wife, Penina, against her, misunderstanding husband, and now a judging priest who condemns her without the facts without getting all the information, he misjudges her. Do we hurt for her? I think we have to hurt for her. How long will you go on being drunk? Put, her, put your wine away from you. Now, here's the amazing thing about Hannah. This virtuous woman could have said, what about your two sons? Couldn't she? They were sinful and wicked in the temple. They did horrible things. And she could have tit for tat gone back at him, but she didn't. But Hannah answered, verse 15, No, my Lord. She treats him with respect and dignity. I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along, I have been speaking 
out of my great anxiety and vexation. How respectful, how humble, how honorable she spoke. Eli got it. Eli said, go in peace. The God of Israel grants your petition that you have made to him. He didn't even ask her what she was praying for. As I said <clears throat> earlier in one of the other sessions, we don't need to know all the details. And he didn't need to know the details. But somehow, God used him to convince her, God has heard your prayer. He said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She got the answer to her dilemma. God helped her through these words of Eli. Verse 19, they rose up early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. And they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord. <laughs> The Lord remembered her, and in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Gotta love this story. <laughs> and yeah, you have to be thankful for people who name their daughters Hannah, name their son Samuel. This is an incredible story in the Bible of God's amazing kindness and grace. Her prayers were answered. And the interesting thing, we don't know why she asked for a son, but we do know what happened. <clears throat> he grew up to be a nation changer. Here's a woman who, through her prayers, brought about the change of the whole nation of Israel. Samuel followed God, and Samuel changed the direction of the nation of Israel away from God to God. Now that's an answer of prayer. Now that's a woman who prayed. That's a woman whom God used. A humble, quiet servant of God whom God used. So we have many options of looking at this and this template, if I could say it that way, for our situation. And as I was preparing for tonight, I decided, I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to do it, to tell of a great painful circumstance in my life. It was 19, I have to think, 69, 79. It was about 79. Our church went into deep tension. And a whole year went by with this deep tension and then came on one, in one week a complete rupture in the church. A third of the people left. And it had been 10 years we'd been working to get that far and a third of the people left. I was devastated. And I tried to practice what I Believe what I told you, I turned to the Lord. I was away, it happened in May, and I was away from Stuttgart, our home, at Word of Life camp in the summer as Bible teacher, and in my quiet time in the afternoons, apart from the camping sessions where I spoke, God spoke to my heart, and he made it clear I should draw closer to the Lord. And I knew that would mean three things more prayer, more of the Word of God, and more consistent obedience. I didn't know what else it might mean, but I knew for sure those three. And I prayed a lot. I learned a lot about prayer. So I made this commitment. It was in, in late June or early July, and I had this feeling, this is going to be cool. I'm going to draw closer to God. I'm going to feel warm and fuzzy inside. It's just going to get better and better every day. 
Because you can measure how much Bible do you read. I read more. I spent more time in prayer. I focused more in pr on praying. And I thought, this is really going to be cool. And a few days into this journey, I was hit with terrible thoughts because I saw a third of the people had left the church and I felt failure as a leader. I failed. And with this on my heart, I began thinking about that and I would pray about it and pray about the people who left. I would pray for them. I sought to pray blessing on their lives. And then one day, I was, I call it, hit by a freight train in my mind. My quiet living room of my thoughts were completely disarranged by a freight train that went through my mind saying, take your life. And I realized that's from the devil. God is the giver of life, and that sentence didn't come from him. And I realized I was in a bad way. And so I began praying more. And I, I had learned already, but I began to see it was necessary to read the Bible more. And sometimes these thoughts would come often at midnight. I'd get in to bed to go to sleep, and these thoughts are just buzzing in my head. Terrible thoughts. I couldn't get rid of them. I couldn't go to sleep. I was high on adrenaline because of the thoughts. And so I would get up quietly. At that time, we had our bedrooms upstairs, and there was a foyer. All of those bedroom doors did not have windows, so I'd get up and I'd walk out in the foyer, under the lamp in the foyer, turn the light on, have my Bible in my hand, and I'd read. I'd read the Bible. And here's what happened. I'd, I'd read, and I, my eyes went down the left column and the right column. I got to the bottom of the right column, and I couldn't remember a thing I'd read. These thoughts constantly running through my mind, throw your life away, throw your life away. And so I had learned something earlier about the importance of taking charge of our thoughts, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so hmm, I thought, God help me here, and he gave me a really good idea. Read it out loud. So I did that. I'd read out loud, and, and I, as I'm reading, I can feel these thoughts trying to get through, but my eyes read over the text, my mouth spoke it, my ears heard it, and all the input to my brain, they were blocked by the, the Word of God. They did, those terrible thoughts couldn't get through. And sometimes I would read for an hour, and after an hour, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, I'd begin to get sleepy, and I'd quietly crawl in bed and go to sleep. Sometimes it was two or three hours in the night, and I'd get up in the morning, and I'd start into a new day, and it might be an hour. And in the new day, these thoughts would hit. The freight train would be back, dirty, uninvited, domineering in my thoughts. And I said, okay, Lord. And so I'd plow back into the Word of God. Now, did I say I wanted to spend more time in the Word? <laughs> God forced me into the Word. And I learned that I, I was displacing the thoughts. Now, I'm going to illustrate something. <clears throat> don't tell somebody to not think something. Don't, don't think about a polar bear. So all of you just imaged a polar bear, right? It's the way our mind works. We don't tell our mind not to think that. We displace those thoughts, like displacing water out of a jar. We're putting a large stone in it. It pushes water out of the jar. You put truth in the place of lies. Satan was feeding me lies. You have to displace those lies out of your brain and get them out. And as I did that, I had great success. And this went on day after day, week after week, night after night. And I thought, oh Lord, this is, this is long. <laughs> and I kept begging, 
with desperation. Lord, an end. Please, an end. And it was November. Oh, I, I, something else I learned. I couldn't pray about everything. Now, that sounds totally heretical, especially coming from me, who I've taught prayer for decades and tried to model it and encourage people to pray, but here's why. I always, you heard me say it a few minutes ago, I always wanted to pray blessing on the people who had said nasty things about me or to me when they left the church. They spread all kinds of nasty things through the whole neighborhood. And I said, Lord, bless them. I didn't want to curse them. I wanted to bless them. I wanted to, God to do them good. And so I found out something after I learned to displace these thoughts with truth in Bible reading out loud that when I prayed for those people who left and I prayed for them by name, I invited the freight train to come back. And I made a, an arrangement with God. Uh, he never told me that he took me up on the arrangement, but I said, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pray for them one last time right now by name, all of them. And I'm going to give it to you and every time they come back in my thoughts, I'm going to get out my Bible and displace it. And so I did. When it happens later, I didn't pray for them more. I trusted that God heard that one prayer, and he would listen to it, and he would bless them anyway. And I just went on displacing those thoughts out of my mind so that I didn't get captured by these terrible thoughts. It was November. This had gone on since July. I was in my basement. We had a chest freezer in the basement. I was standing right beside it, I can tell you, and there's a vertical post right there. <laughs> I can see that as if it were yesterday or this morning. And a thought, a Bible verse came through my mind. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know those words from Job chapter 1. Job lost everything. And he did the most inconceivable thing. He said, God, you gave all these children, all these possessions, and you took. And in all of it, you are blessed. And something happened that day in my mind. I remember thinking as the church was growing, and it was growing well, the Lord is blessing. He has sent new people. The Lord is blessed. Blessed be his name. And then they left. And when they left, I looked at my failure and their failure, but I didn't see God's sovereign hand in it. God was working to do something in their lives and my lives because they did not belong to me. What had I done? I had put my hands on God's property. Oh my, I recognized that in a five minute period and I immediately said, oh Lord, please forgive me. I put my hands on your property. I sinned and he forgave me. My heart was free. The burden lifted, and I was thankful. But I was also uncertain, because this had gone on for four months, every single day. I thought, well, I don't know if it's over or if it's just like after I've read the Bible for two hours. And I woke up the next morning, and the freight train didn't come back. I thought, this is a good day, but I was still scared, <laughs> still uncertain. A week went by. Two weeks went by, no freight train. And I said, Lord, <laughs> I weep as I sing that song we sang. The Lord is so good and gracious, so kind to his children. And I said, oh, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm not finished learning lessons about this, and I've had several freight train attacks since then, but I know exactly what to do. 
one time it happened and I was in the bathtub and I, I felt my body be rushed with adrenaline. These thoughts came and I thought, I'm in trouble. And I was out of that bathtub in seconds. The floor was soaked everywhere. I didn't care. I, I said, I've got to get to my Bible. I've got to start reading out loud. I've got to displace these evil thoughts or they'll take charge of me. And God helped. And it lasted maybe 15 or 20 minutes or half an hour. I have such thankfulness for this book. I am alive today because of this book. I'm alive because of God's truth. I'm alive because he helped me with his great supernatural help to dive into the book and not turn from him when it was tough. I did a lot of weeping, and people didn't understand. I told one person about it, one person very close to me, about the struggle in that time. And the response led me to say, well, in my mind, I'll not tell you ever anything again about this. Because I was mocked rather than God understanding or care or concern. So, what did I learn? Well, you've heard so much of what I've learned. I've learned the power of truth. I've learned that we're all in spiritual battle. I've learned that in spiritual battle, we battle with truth, God's truth. We don't step back and let the enemy take over. We get aggressive in our fight back. We use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, against the lies of Satan. And I have said it several times this weekend, and I'll say it again this evening. We are facing very uncertain times, and the enemy is out for all of us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy all Christians, all churches, everything that's godly and good. Satan wants to destroy. He's after you and me personally and us collectively as churches. And we're going to have to battle in this horrifying situation with spiritual tools to win the spiritual battle. There's no way politics can do anything but make further messes of it. Don't trust the politicians for help in this time. It's God who is going to help, and God alone with God's means. Supernatural means for the supernatural victory. That's what Hannah did. She acted godly. She didn't allow revenge to come up in her heart. She didn't become bitter. She had sorrow, but not anger and bitterness. And she spoke respectfully to the priest rather than snippy, or biting or caustically to him. She was respectable and honorable as a woman, a woman greatly to be honored. So as we look at this subject and we look at our lives, I don't know, of course, I said it, I don't know where anybody else is in the room in regard to what's troubling you, what's painful, what kind of desperation do you feel in your heart? I hope tonight has been an invitation to a godly response, a response inwardly toward God. God, I trust you. I trust you like Job. A godly response toward people, not seeing people as the enemy, but seeing Satan trying to destroy, trying to destroy good relationships, good churches, seeking with all he has to destroy God's work and God's people. And we can trust him because he's good. He's always good. This is one thing I'm glad God brings to mind here as we come to a close. I learned in that time, I learned decades ago, to hang on to like you hang on to a life-giving pillar. When it gets tough, never let go of the goodness of God. 
In Germany, I'd heard this so many times. People would mock God. They would mock the ways of God. They would make fun of God. And they would, if the, if the Holocaust came up, where was God in that? What kind of a God allows that? And they mocked him. When things are tough and we're desperate, be respectful toward God. He's good. He's got something good planned. You might not see it at the moment. It might go, go on for months. It might go on for years. But he is good. They may not be good. The situation may be evil, but God is good. God never ceases to be good. Don't ever let go of the goodness of God. I've heard of many who experience spiritual shipwreck because they lose their grip, trusting in the goodness of God. He is always good, never failing good. We sang about it, such good singing, good, good music. I loved the singing tonight. It almost like a repeat as a close. One of the songs we sang that, when we sang toward the end a cappella, it was so beautiful. But we're going to do tonight like we've done in the other sessions. We're going to pray together. Some of you are here tonight for the first time, and I have done what I did in the prayer class regularly and have done in every meeting here, have ended our time with a prayer session. And tonight, without music, please. Tonight, where we just have quiet while we're praying, just our voices. We all gather and cluster in little groups of two or three and pray, responding to what we've heard. Maybe you're here with a great burden. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I would, I would be very, very, very surprised if there aren't a number of people here tonight with great, great burdens on your heart. Desperate. You're desperate for an answer. And I know the God who has the answer, who is the answer. I don't know the answer, but God does. So I'd like to ask us to go to prayer in small groups where we are. If you need to turn around with somebody behind you or beside you so that you can pray in groups of two or three, that we'll take the next five or ten minutes or so and pray. This morning we had the clock pounding against us, at least in the first service. I feel no pressure from the clock. Uh, this isn't late. They started at 6 o'clock, and it's just now uh, 5 minutes, 3 minutes till 7. So if we were to take the next 10 minutes to pray, that would be no problem. We've got lots to pray about. When you're finished praying, one person praying, the other person pray. I said this in the other meetings, but in the prayer class I learned this that if I didn't instruct that everybody was to keep on praying, then some would stop and they'd get in conversation and they'd giggle and they'd carry on and the rest were praying. And I thought, somebody missed the point here, the, the memo. The memo is we're here to pray. And the memo is please keep praying. One pray, the other pray. Pray around, pray lots of times. And pray if you're, if you're finished praying about yourself, pray about the church, pray about your family, pray about the nation, pray about the county, pray about the world, pray about the election. Pray about the wars going on. Pray, pray, pray. We've got thousands of things to pray about. We'll never run out in the next 10 minutes. And so I'd like to encourage us to go to prayer and put the burdens that are on our hearts before the Lord and ask the Lord to teach us all how to respond to hard times, desperate times, with godly prayer and the spirit of our sweet Hannah. Let's go to prayer. I'll close in prayer in a few minutes.